right, good morning. I want to welcome you this morning to Berean Bible Church. Uh, this message will be a little different today. Um, <laughs> not your average Christmas message, maybe. Um, you know, if you sit down and really think about it, there's a whole lot about the church or churchianity that's not biblical. The church often does things for no reason other than we've done this in the past. And more of what the church does, I think, today is tradition rather than Bible. Now, tradition is the transmission of customs or beliefs from one generation to the other. And traditions are not bad. I mean, a lot of us have family traditions. We have different traditions that we do. There's traditions in the church. Traditions are not bad unless... They're going against Scripture, unless you're following tradition instead of following Scripture. Do you realize that many of the practices, many of the traditions, many of the beliefs that Christians practice today are not even found in the Bible? And that's supposed to be the book that guides our lives, that directs us. One of the problems we face is that traditions are hard to break. You know, people hold a tradition, it's like they hold that above all else almost. And if you break those traditions, you often ruffle feathers of those who hold to those traditions, and they don't like that too much. Yeshua's most harsh words were reserved for the religious leaders of the day. And among His most harsh words for them was the elevation of tradition over God. And that's, again, that's what, that's what I said. That's where tradition becomes a problem. When we elevate it over the Scriptures, when we elevate it over the things of God, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees had no problem with man-made rules and regulations that they used to clarify what God had to say. And God was often lost in the process. Look what Yeshua says in Mark 7. And He said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, Hypocrites. Now that wasn't very nice, I know, but uh, he didn't live in our culture with you know everybody being offended over everything, and so he said what was true. They were hypocrites, as is as it is written. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition. Of men. So Yeshua starts out here calling them hypocrites. Now, this word hypocrites came out of the Greek theater. It's got the idea of wearing a mask. You know, when you're in a play, you pretend to be somebody you're not. You put on a mask. And that's what Yeshua is saying. You pretend to be these religious leaders that are very spiritual and very wise. He says, in reality, you're wearing a mask. You're just selfish, arrogant self-righteous men. Hypocrites, he said. He says, you leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Yeshua quotes here from Isaiah 29, 12-14. And in that passage, the prophet contrasts learning the Word and living by it with those who live by the traditions of men. Now, Isaiah wrote in the days of the divided kingdom, the northern kingdom of Israel had built its own temple, ordained its own priesthood, and they would soon find themselves destroyed. But the passage wasn't written to the northern kingdom. It's written to the southern kingdom. It was written to the people who had the true temple of God and the true priesthood and the true sacrifices. Because of what they had, they looked down their arrogant noses at the northern kingdom. But Yahweh challenged their false worship. He said that it was all a sham, they were worshiping on the outside, but their hearts were not in it. Now, the word heart here is cardia, and it refers to the mind or the thinking. See, they have God talk without God thinking. Their worship, he says, is vain. And the word vain here is matain, which means to, avoid, to void the results. Their worship has no result in honoring God. It's without purpose. It's ritual without any reality. Now I want to see here from these two verses 
that there's a parallel between these people honor me in verse 6 and they worship me in verse 7 that at the essence of all worship is honoring God. That's what worship is. It's to give honor to Him. Notice also that it's God that they are worshiping. But their worship is vain. So they're worshiping the true God, but they're worshiping Him in the wrong way. Now Yeshua is telling them that their worship is vain. And this raises a question for us. What is worship? What were they doing that was wrong? Well, the word worship means honor paid to a superior being. It means to give honor, homage, respect, adoration, praise to the glory of God. The Hebrew word for worship is a powerful one. It literally describes the physical act of prostrating yourself on the floor before a sovereign. Someone who has complete control over you. Now the English word worship is derived from the Anglo-Saxon word worship, which means one worthy of reverence, one worthy of honor. So we see that the word worship is honoring God, giving Him glory. How do we honor God? Well, in order to honor God, we have to know Him. And the only way we can get to know Him is through His Word. And that's why studying the Bible, reading the Bible is so important for us because it's the self-revelation of God. The Bible teaches us that God is holy and that we are to fear Him. Would you classify yourself as a God-fearing man or woman? You used to hear that a lot, you know, but you don't hear that much anymore. They're God-fearer. You know, as God dealt with the children of Israel, He continually stressed that they were to fear Him. We see this in Deuteronomy 4.10. How on the day that you stood before Yahweh, your God, at Horeb, Yahweh said to me, Gather the people to me, that I may let them hear my words, so that they will learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children so. So God says, I want them to hear my words, and the reason I want them to hear my words is so they'll fear me, and they'll teach their children to fear me. Now, you may be thinking, well, isn't fearing God like an old covenant concept? I mean, are we new covenant believers to fear God? Well, speaking of the new covenant that was to come, Jeremiah said this, I will make with them an everlasting covenant, that's the new covenant, that I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts, that they may not turn away from me. So in the New Testament, in the new covenant, the everlasting covenant, he was going to put the fear of him in people's hearts. Now, as we look at the New Testament, we see an ever-increasing fear of Yeshua the more that people come to understand who He really is. It is my opinion that we desperately need to recover a sense of fear for God in our day. I mean, I think in our day, God has become so casual. He's our buddy. He's our friend. He's the big guy in the sky. All this nonsense. No, He is God. And by fear, I don't mean terror. I mean reverence. There, there's a sense of the fear the way we use it because there's awe, there's reverence there. Paul told the Ephesians that they are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now sadly, all too often, a proper fear of God is not a prominent part of the Christian's life. Fear of Yahweh just isn't part of the culturally correct which means mainly psychologically correct view of a healthy, satisfying religious life. Fear is viewed as harmful by our culture. Children today have no fear of their parents. Citizens have no fear of lawful authorities. And yet the Bible tells us that we are to live out our lives in fear. You know, this is a subject you certainly don't hear much about in our day, but I think it's still vital to our Christian faith. And I think we desperately need to recover a sense of awe and reverence for Yahweh in our day. We need to begin to view Him in the infinite majesty that belongs to Him who is the Creator and Supreme Sovereign of the universe. There is an infinite gap in worth and dignity between Yahweh the Creator and man the creature. 
And the fear of Yahweh is a heartfelt recognition of this gap. In other words, we understand who He is. And we understand who we are. And when we have a reverence for God, we will desire to obey Him, to honor Him. We'll put His Word above all on biblical tradition because we want His praise. We want to be honoring to Him and not our fellow man. Now, speaking of tradition, I think that most Christians don't realize that our Christmas celebration is nothing but tradition. Now, I said traditions aren't bad, all bad, you know, unless they violate Scripture, but Christmas, you know, hearing Stan talk today about Korea and Morocco, and in Morocco, they're talking about Christmas, well, yeah, we wish we could get a tree. But they're connecting that with Christ. Because you see a tree, it's like, oh, that's all about Christ, right? Here's what troubles me about Christmas, people. (laughs) Is that many who call themselves Christians believe that our Christmas celebration is somehow about Christ. I mean, you often hear, we need to keep Christ in Christmas. And I'm like, he doesn't belong there. He never was there. Why would you try to put him there? What about our Christmas celebration? And when I say our, I'm talking America. But obviously, it's not just America. It's the world. What about the way we celebrate Christmas is about Christ? What if it reminds you about Christ? What if it you know, honors Him and brings glory to Him? When you think about Christmas, what comes to your mind? Most, if not all of us, have celebrated Christmas in the traditional fashion since we were born. My earliest memories of Christmas was present, present, and more present. That's what Christmas was about. I mean, I can remember my brother and I staying up all night. Our parents wouldn't allow us out of the room till like 5 in the morning. Okay, we had to stay. That was an early morning for them, but they were trying to compromise with us. All right, we didn't sleep, my brother. We stayed up all night. What time is it? What time is it? You know, anxious to get out there, you know, so we could worship the Lord. No, we didn't. We just wanted to tear those presents open. I remember one year, my brother and I figured out we got each of our gifts, looked up the price, and calculated it to make sure we got the same amount. We were greedy little things, I'll tell you, you know. But, but I'll tell you, there, without any exaggeration, my home at Christmas, you could not see the living room floor for presents. You could not. And I mean, you know, we, we had to tough through opening all those presents. Our fingers were bloodied by the time we got done. It was a rough. It was rough on us as children. But that's my memory. It's opening a lot of gifts. And then often being tortured by my parents because we had to leave to go visit relatives. We just got all this loot. We want to play with it. You know, so I have conflicting thoughts about Christmas. But but many things, you know, when you ask people about Christmas, many things come to people's mind. Well, it's the lights. You know, I love the beautiful lights. And maybe to someone it's the tree. Like we heard today from Morocco, they want to have a Christmas tree. Maybe it's the presents. Maybe it's the food. I'll tell you one thing I like about Christmas is for two weeks I quit any rationality of eating and dieting and I just have fun, okay? Now in January I pay for it, okay? But that's kind of my Christmas tradition. To some people, Christmas is Santa Claus. Now that's troubling to me, you know, because parents teach their kids about this big fat man with the long white beard. He knows if they're sleeping, he knows if they're awake, he knows if they're bad, he knows they're, he's omniscient in other words. Well, then later on, the kids figure out, that guy's not real. What about this other guy you've been telling me about, Yeshua? Is he real? I remember going in the Christian bookstore when our kids were little, and the the lady in the Christian bookstore, what's Santa going to bring you? My daughter looked up at him and said, Santa's not real. And the look on this lady's face, in a Christian bookstore. (laughs) And she she thought, like, we were bad parents. Okay? To some, it's family gatherings. That's a good thing. Could, could be. <laughs> it's 
Some people, when you talk about Christmas, actually think of the birth of Christ. I'm not sure how or why, but how much of Christmas is Christian? I mean, we associate it with the birth of Christ, and in some way we see it as a celebration of His birth. And that's what troubles me. How is what we do celebrating Christ's birth? Putting up a tree, buying presents, you know, putting up lights on our house, overeating, overdrinking, doing all these things, and it's all about Christ. How does He fit into any of that? How does it honor His birth? Is there really anything Christian about Christmas? It's connected. Let me tell you, it's inseparably connected. No one will ever disjoint this no matter how hard you try. Okay? What about the name? I mean, Christmas. Well, the word Christmas means Mass of Christ. As it came to be shortened, Christ Mass. The Christ Mass was a Roman Catholic Mass which grew out of a feast day established in 1038 A.D. The Christ Mass has nothing to do with Scriptures or the birth of Christ The Encyclopedia Britannica, 1946 edition, says this, Christmas was not among the earliest festivals of the church. It was not instituted by Christ or the apostles or the Bible authority. It was picked up afterwards from paganism. Now, along with the Encyclopedia Britannica, many teach today that Christmas was adopted from a pagan holiday that December 25th came from the holiday of Saturnalia. It was just a pagan thing. It was a Roman you know, observance of the birth of the invincible sun on December 25th. But that has been challenged lately, and maybe for good reason. William J. Ty disagrees with the idea in an article that he's written in Touchstone Magazine called Calculating Christmas, the story behind December 25th. In the article, he says this, many Christians think that Christians celebrate Christ's birth on December 25th because the church fathers appropriated the date of a pagan festival. In other words, there was a pagan festival and they Christianized it. Almost no one minds, except for a few group on the fringes of American evangelicalism, who seem to think that this makes Christmas itself a pagan festival. It is a pagan festival. It is, okay? But it is perhaps interesting to note that the choice of December 25th is a result of attempts among the earliest Christians to figure out the date of Jesus' birth based on the calendar calculations that had nothing to do with the pagan festival. So he said the date doesn't come from paganism. It's just the early church was really trying to figure out the real date. I don't know that I buy that because I don't know how they came up with that date because I think there's evidence to another date. He goes on to say, Rather, the pagan festival of the birth of the unconquered son, instituted by the Roman Emperor Aurelian on 25 December 274, was almost certainly an attempt to create a pagan alternative to a date that was already of some significance to the Roman Christians. So he's flipping this backwards. He says, you know, no, they came up with this date to copy ours. Christians, basically. He says, thus the pagan origins of Christmas is a myth without historical substance. After a lengthy argument to prove his point that Christmas didn't come from pagan celebration, he concludes the article by saying this, Thus, December 25th, as the date of the church's birth, appears to owe nothing whatsoever to pagan influences upon the practice of the church during or after Constantine's time. It is wholly unlikely to have been the actual date of Christ's birth. I'm glad he threw that part in there. But it arose entirely from the efforts of the early Latin Christians to determine the historical date of Christ's death, birth. In other words, they were just trying to Christ's death. They were trying to figure out when was the Lord bur- born. Yeah, why does it say death there? I'm not sure if I, that's mine or if that's his. I don't know. I think it should be birth. All right, they're trying to figure out the date of his birth. That, that's what he's trying to say here. So maybe, maybe the celebration of Christmas didn't come from a pagan festival. However it came about, it seems to me to be truly pagan now. I mean, the things we do don't seem to be, you know, Christ-honoring, so to speak, as many people think, all right? Now, there's many ways to prove that December 25th wasn't the date of Christ's birth. 
So I don't know why the early Christians would ever come up with that as a date. And we've gone over this many times, and you can go back to former messages around this time of year. I always preach my bah humbug message. So you can go back. Luke writes this, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Now, most modern versions of the story of Yeshua's birth go something like this. Joseph and Mary arrive in Bethlehem late on December 25th. Mary's in labor, about to give birth. The local inn has its no vacancy sign flashing. So the tired couple seeks alternatives to find none. With no other options, wearied from their journey and desperate from, for shelter because she's going into labor already, they spend the night in a, sa- in a stable with the animals where the Lord is born. Then the shepherds come and then the three kings show up and worship him. That's kind of how we got our story. And you see that in nativity scenes. The shepherds are there. The wise men are there. Everybody's there together, okay? It's so far from reality that, you know, but again, you just can't smash traditions <laughs> that are sacred, all right? What's interesting here is the Greek word translated in here is kataluma. It means a place of rest, usually a guest room. In fact, Luke, the same writer, uses this word later where it clearly refers to a guest room and not an inn. Most houses in that culture had a guest room for people. Look at Luke 22, 11. And tell the master of the house, the teacher says, where is the guest room, kataluma, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? All right, so you got the same author, Luke, the same Greek word, kataluma, but the translators translated in inn in one place and guest room in another. Why? Because tradition just pushes them to say, well, the inn had no room in it. The linguistic evidence shows that Luke used the term kataluma not to mean an inn, but a guest room. The definite article is used, the kataluma. Ha kataluma, the guest room. The room of a particular house. The cultural information gives us new understanding into the story of Yeshua's birth. He wasn't kicked out. He had no place to go. He was a son of David, okay? These people are heirs of David. They would have been welcomed into the town. They would have been given a, a special place. So they find shelter with a family whose separate guest room was either full or too small to accommodate the family. And so they're accepted into the house. And the birth takes place there on a raised terrace of the family room. And the baby's laid in the manger. You say, what are they doing with a manger in their house? The people kept animals in their house, not in a manger. They brought them into the house. They kept them there, kept the animals warm, helped heat the house. This is all cultural stuff, people, that's really important. Because you put the cultural stuff back into the story and you find out what the true story is. All right? All right, so he wasn't, you know, kicked out. There was no place in the nice hotel there. The Holiday Inn wasn't booked. So he couldn't stay there. He was staying with family. All right, now let's go back to our text in Luke 2. It says, there were shepherds out in the field. Now, shepherds didn't live in the fields in Palestine during December. They brought their flocks in from the mountainsides and fields to corral them no later than October 15th to protect them from the cold, rainy season that followed. Now, in his book, The Birth of Christ Recalculated, Ernest Martin uses the astronomical signs of Revelation 12, 1 and 2. He says that the year 3 B.C. was the time when Christ was born. These astronomical signs came to a precise agreement in the year 3 B.C. for less than two hours, as observed from Palestine, and it happened on September 11th. This is the only day in the whole year that these signs in Revelation 12, and we, several years ago, we went into this and looked at it. If you want more information, go back to that message and look at it, because I'm not an astronomer, but if Martin is right, it seems to be quite clear that Christ was born on September 11th, 3 B.C. So if you all will remind me, next September we'll sing some Birth of Christ songs on, on September 11th next year, so we can be kind of accurate about that. 
Now we know that the, the date of Christ's birth, let me say that the apostles and the early church never celebrated Christ's birth at any time. Hey, Yeshua, it's your birthday today. Let's have a... You don't see that, okay? There's no command or instruction to celebrate Christ's birth in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the celebrating of birthdays is a pagan, not a Christian custom. The Scriptures tell us that we're to celebrate Christ's death in the observance of the Lord's Supper, but we're never told to celebrate His birth. So we find out that the name Christmas is not Christian, it's not biblical. The date, suppose, of celebration of Christ's birth, December 25th, that's not biblical, that's not Christian, that's not something we're told to do. What about the exchange of presents? I mean, that's biblical, right? Because, you know, this is a major part of our Christmas celebration. This is a picture from my house when I was a child. <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> that's true. You wouldn't be able to see the tree if it was my house, all right? Yeah, a third of them. <clears throat> Many claim that this whole idea of gift-giving is patterned after the wise men who gave gifts to Yeshua. Well, if you're celebrating my birthday and you give everybody presents but me, I don't get that. I don't like that. I don't think that's right. If it's Yeshua's birthday, he should be getting the presents, right? We give them to everybody else and we forget he's even there sometimes, all right? Here's what we have to understand, another cultural thing. The wise men weren't at Christ's birth, okay? But here's an interesting thing that I discovered in the last couple of years that, that I think is kind of cool. It seems to be that there's evidence that December 25th was the day that the wise men did show up to bring him gifts. So that's kind of cool. There you go. You got gift giving on December 25th. Right. <laughs> no trees. All right. And, and we'll look at this in a minute, but Ernest Martin in his book, The Birth of Christ Recalculated, says this, Jupiter, recognized by Jews and Gentiles alike as the planet of the Messiah, was located in Virgo's womb and standing still directly over Bethlehem on December 25th, 2 B.C., when the child was a little over a year old. So this is when he thinks the wise men show up. Now, in his book, The Star of Bethlehem, Frederick Larson states this, With software which incorporates Kelper's equations, we can create a computer model of the universe. In minutes, we can produce thousands of the sky maps, which was a great labor before computers. We can animate the universe in real time at any speed we choose, make months pass in moments, or wind back the clock, we can view the sky precisely as it moved over Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. I've seen these maps, and it's incredible what you can do with the software now. Matthew tells us this. Now, after Yeshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, the wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. Now, commenting on this verse, Larson says, it can't be proven from the text, but it's quite possible that some of the Magi were of Jewish descent, perhaps a Jewish remnant from Daniel's day. This would help explain why a Jewish philosopher, Philo, would admire them and why they were watching the sky for things Jewish, why they wanted to worship a Jewish king, and why they were taken so seriously by Herod and Jewish chief priests. If they were not Jews, then they must have been most impressive magi indeed, as Jews of the time were deeply disdainful of pagans and their beliefs. I think he's right. I think there's no doubt these magi were Jewish. I mean, that's what it's all about. They're watching the sky. They're following the Jewish scriptures. Larson says that the star that they saw was the planet Jupiter. Now, in ancient times, planets like Jupiter were considered wandering stars, Larson goes on to say, A magi watching Jupiter that September saw two objects moving so close that they appeared to touch. The close approach of celestial bodies is sometimes called a conjunction. Our Middle Eastern viewers saw Jupiter coming into a close conjunction with the star Regulus. 
<clears throat> Matthew 2, 9 says this, After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place where the child was. Now, notice that the star, it went on before him, it was moving, and then it stopped. So this star that they were following stops over Bethlehem. This account is not of the birth of Yeshua, as I said. This is over a year after his birth. Larson says, An astronomer tracking the movement of the planets through the star field watches not so much on the scale of minutes, but on the larger scale of days, weeks, and months. On this scale of time, Jupiter did stop. On December 25th of 2 BC, as it entered retrograde, Jupiter reached full stop in its travel through the fixed stars. Magi viewing from Jerusalem would have seen it stopped in the sky above the little town of Bethlehem. So according to Larson, the astronomical chart shows that it was December 25th. I just think that's cool. That gives some meaning to this time of year. When Jupiter stopped in the sky... And when the wise men presented Yeshua with their gifts, he also made the comment, nobody believes that Jesus was born December 25th. Well, he's definitely wrong there. A lot of people believe. <laughs> A lot of people believe that. Maybe he means nobody uh, who's looked into this. I, I don't know. I, again, I'm no astronomer, but if what Ernest Martin and Frederick Larson are saying is true, I think this is kind of cool. Now, notice what actually happened on December 25th. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So what these wise men are doing is worshipping the king. Remember Herod had ordered the slaughter of all infants from two years old and under, indicating that the child is no longer a newborn. So when the Magi show up to worship Yeshua, it's December 25th, 2 B.C., and notice that all the Magi were there to worship Him, to give Him gifts. They didn't give gifts to each other. So biblically, what happened on December 25th is not the birth of, birth of Christ, but it was a day when the wise men worshipped Him, Yeshua as sovereign King of the world. So how much of Christmas is Christian? None of it. By that I mean our celebration, the name, whatever, any of it. None of it's biblical. None of it's commanded by the Lord. None of it was apostolic. None of it was ever observed by the early church. Yet to many Christians, this is a religious holiday. You know, when Israel had religious holidays, Passover, Sukkot, they were all about God and all about sacrifices, all about pointing to Christ. But we have this holiday that we say is a religious holiday. And like I said, if you sit down and think about it, there's nothing about it that points to Christ or is Christian. Giving gifts to everybody else doesn't say, oh, well, I'm a Christian, so I'm very giving. No, that's not, you know, you can't tie this thing together with Christ no matter how hard you try, okay? I'm talking to you. <laughs> but to many Christians, it is a religious holiday. The Puritans in America called Christmas Romish rags and deliberately worked on December 25th to show disdain for the holiday. I mean, they were fighting this big time. They, I'm not going to that extent. There's no point. You're not going to win. They didn't win. In 1644, the English Puritans passed a law making Christmas a working day, and they made it illegal to cook plum pudding or mince pie. <laughs> Let's pass a law. You can't do this. But it just gives you an idea. They hated this. They hated the fact that you know, it was connected with Christ, and they were trying to separate this. They're trying to smash traditions, and they can't do it. Christians today work hard to keep Christ in Christmas, don't they? I mean, there's a Christian song that says, He's the reason for the season. He's the purpose of it all. 
What? He's the purpose for our overindulgence in food. He's the purpose for us spending money we don't have to buy gifts for people we don't like, things they don't need. Uh, he's the purpose of that. He's the purpose of trees. He's the purpose of lights. He's the reason for the sea. No, he's not. Not at all. He's the purpose for myths like Santa Claus. In our country, Santa plays a way bigger part in Christmas than Yeshua. Okay? You've got to see that. You've got to admit that. You don't see Yeshua at every mall letting little kids sit on his lap. You know, it's all about Santa. And like I said, why, why mix the birth of Yeshua with pagan myths? It seems to belittle the importance of the birth. It just seems to make the birth of Christ another fable. Like all the other things at Christmas. Again, is He the purpose for our materialism, our drunkenness, our gluttony that are associated with Christmas? How does anything we do at Christmas honor Christ? So I think what I'd like you to understand is that Christ and Christmas have nothing to do with each other from a biblical point of view. The only way that Christ is connected with Christmas is through tradition. But today, most of Christianity views it as a, a, a holiday, a, a sacred day, a Christian day. There's nothing Christian about Christmas. People may call Christmas Christ's birthday. It's not. You can call a mouse a lion. It's still not one. You can call a male female. It's still not one. Okay? You can do all this stuff. It doesn't make it true. Just because you want it to be so. Now, saying all that, let me make this very clear. I don't think it's wrong for believers to celebrate Christmas. Christmas is a, just a holiday. It's just like the 4th of July, just like Valentine's Day. It's, it just take Christ out of it. Don't, don't work so hard to put Christ where He doesn't belong, and you can enjoy it. It's like we can't just enjoy this holiday. We, got, we get up on Christmas morning. There's 10,000 presents around the tree. We all have to read Luke 2 before we open the presents. We're going to sanctify this pagan holiday by reading some scripture. No, just, I know it. Just listen, just enjoy the day. It's not wrong to have a tree. It's not wrong to have lights. It's not wrong to give presents. But we don't need to say this is a spiritual day. It's not. It's not His birthday. Nothing we do is honoring to Him in the sense of for His glory. The birth of Christ is a miraculous event of great significance. But I think associating with Christmas and all the myths makes His birth insignificant. The birth of Christ is about God becoming a man so He could die for our sins. Matthew 1, 21-23 says, she will bear a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua. Yeshua means Yahweh saves. For he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Yeshua came to save His people from their sins. This is the greatest miracle. This is the most fantastic truth recorded in the pages of Scripture. God became a man. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby, unable to do more than lie, stare, wiggle, and make noises. For a short time, God needed to be fed, changed, and taught like other children. My wife and I got into a theological debate on Friday night over the question, did Mary know? And she's, from a mother's perspective, saying, yes, Mary knew. She understood. And I'm like, no way. I mean, I think she understood some things. You know, she had a child, you know, by virgin birth, so she knew something was going on. But did she know that when she kissed that little baby, she kissed the face of God? Did she, could she, <laughs> and my wife and I still disagree on this, but 
But I love that song, Mary, did you know? Because I think it's so, you know, it just gives us a picture of what's happening here. That God has become a man. She did know the scriptures, but so did all the disciples, and they were absolute. <laughs> okay, that's how she won the argument, okay? I said, she said, Mary knew the scriptures. I said, so did the disciples, and they had no clue what was happening. She goes, well, they were men. And I'm like, okay, you win. <laughs> In mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis says this, the eternal being who knows everything and who created the whole universe became not only a man, but before that a baby, and before that a fetus inside a woman's body. If you want to get the hang of it, think of how you would like to become a slug. You know, the more you think about it, the more staggering it is. Nothing in fiction is so fantastic as the truth of the incarnation that God became a man. The author of Hebrews puts it this way, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he, speaking of Christ, himself likewise partook of the same things, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. He became flesh and blood. He became a man. This speaks of, becoming flesh speaks of frailty. It speaks of dependency, morality. Yahweh became a human being. This is what we call the incarnation, which is a Latin word meaning in flesh. What exactly is the incarnation? God the Son, the second person of the Trinity, who was eternally with God in heaven, took himself, human nature, at a point in time and became a man. He identified not only with our nature, but with the conditions in which we live on earth. The person of Christ always has been, but at a point in time he began to be what he eternally was not, a man. Yet he didn't cease to be God. Lazarus put it this way, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word has been in existence from all eternity. The Word was with God. Now, with God here prohibits us from seeing no distinction between the Father and the Son, as Unitarians do. All right, He's with them. You can't be with yourself. He's talking about a different person. There's a distinction. The Son, the Word, is distinct from the Father. This is Trinitarian. And the Word was God. He was with God, and He was God. In verse 3, we see that the world was created by, by Him. Now, in, <clears throat> in verse 14, Lazarus writes this, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory. The glory is of the only from the, begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. I like the way the complete Jewish Bible translates this. It says, the Word became a human being, and He lived with us, and we saw His Shekhanah, Shekhanah of the Father's only Son, full of grace and truth. The eternal Word who was with God, the person who created everything that exists, this teaches us the staggering truth that Yeshua of Nazareth who was God, became man. The divine Son became a Hebrew. The Almighty appeared on earth as a helpless human baby. The Word became flesh. The Word <coughs> became, here is the Greek word, ginomai. It signifies entrance into a new condition. Look at the contrast between verse 1 and verse 14. Verse 1, the Word was God, and in verse 14, the Word was made flesh. So God becomes flesh. In verse 1, the Word was with God, and in verse 14, the Word was with us. He dwelt among us. The word flesh in verse 14 is the Greek word sarx. It refers to all that is essential to human nature. John is saying that Yeshua became one of us in every respect except for sin. He had the mind, the will, and the emotions of a man, not just a body. John didn't say the Word took a body. God assumed the human nature. Yeshua became the God-man. Yeshua is one person with two nature. He is the God-man. He's different from God in that He's man, and He's different from man in that He's God. 
He's the unique person of the universe. The incarnation can be stated as undiminished deity and true humanity in one person forever. I think we must accept the doctrine of the unique God-man in the same way that we accept the Trinity by faith in the Word of God. Colossians 2.9, Paul writes, In Him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. All of deity is in bodily form. Now the word here, dwells, is in the present tense, so it's an ongoing permanent state. The incarnation is at this moment a present reality. He says in Romans 8, 3, for God, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. The statement that God sent His Son in the likeness of sinful flesh has bothered a lot of people. The Greek word translated likeness here is homoioma. It means similar, but different. Did Yeshua only resemble a man? No, He used the word likeness because He wants us to understand that Christ was a man in every way except for sin. He was different from other humans in that He was sinless. Now some might ask the question, is it a big deal that we believe that Yeshua was the God-man? Yes. According to 1 John, it is. 1 John 4. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God. For many false prophets have gone on into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Yeshua, the Christ, has come in the flesh is from God. It's from God. Come in the flesh. You become a man. And every spirit that does not confess that Yeshua is from God, this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. See, anyone who denies the historical event of the Incarnation, John says, is of the spirit of Antichrist. Yeshua became a man in every respect except for sin. We see His humanity all through the New Testament. We've been going through the Gospel of John. We see Him weeping at Lazarus' tomb. We see that He has human feelings. He has human desires, human needs. He hungered. He thirsted. He was weary. He was tired. He sorrowed. He was a man. God the Son had become a man in every respect, except for sin. That's the meaning of the incarnation. But the more important thing that we understand is why. What is the purpose of the incarnation? Why did He come? Why did the second person of the Trinity leave heaven's glory to become incarnate? Did He come to give us a good example? He came to die for us. Matthew 12, 20, 28 says, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. He is God. It would only be right if He came to be served by us, but He came to minister. He came to serve us, to give His life, to pay our sin debt. He came to die. We see this in Matthew one twenty one. We see it in Hebrews 2.14. She will bear a son and you will call His name Yeshua. For He will save His people from their sins. That's what He came to do, to save us from our sins. The writer of Hebrews says, Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, He Himself likewise partook of the same, that through death He might destroy the one that has the power of death. The purpose of the incarnation was specifically that Yeshua might die. The pre-incarnate Christ couldn't die for us because God can't die. Therefore God became a man. So the ultimate purpose was that through his death as a sinless man, he could redeem man. The Bible teaches that the wages of sin is death. We've all sinned and therefore all deserve to perish. But Yeshua died for us. He paid our sin debt. He took our penalty. We've been looking at this as we've been looking at the crucifixion the last couple of weeks. As a sinless substitute, he satisfied forever and completely the just demands of a holy God. Yeshua was born to die. That's why He came. If you trust what Yeshua has done for you, you'll receive the forgiveness of your sins and spend the rest of eternity with Him. But if you reject Christ, and if you reject what Christ has done, the Bible says you will perish. John 3.16 
3.36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not believe in the Son, obey there. Again, we've gone into this before. That's the idea of trusting, okay? The, the, the early church believed that to not trust Christ was to not obey Him. And that's right. Obeying Christ is believing the gospel. Whoever does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. The birth of our Lord is so much more important than connected with confuse it with all that goes on at this time of year, all the myths, all the traditions of Christmas. The incarnation was God's gift of love to us. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. Our Lord's birth was a fantastic miracle. It was God becoming man, but our Lord never told us to celebrate it, especially not the way we celebrate Christmas. The purpose of his birth was that he might die for our sins, and we need to separate Christmas traditions from biblical facts, and we'll see that Christmas has nothing to do with Christ. But let's remember that in everything we do, like if you want to celebrate Christmas, that's fine, but whatever you do, you're to do it to the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31, so whether you eat or drink, uh, something we do a lot at this time of year, okay? Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. That's to be the purpose of our lives. That's the devotion of our lives. So whatever we're doing, it's for His glory. Let's pray. Father, we thank You this morning for the opportunity to look at Your Word. Lord, there's so much tradition that binds us, that keeps us sometimes from seeing the truth or accepting the truth of Your Word. I pray that you would give us hearts, Lord, that would desire only to know your word and to follow it. Father, I pray you would not allow us to become critical or judgmental of those who do not understand these things or who celebrate Christmas. And if we celebrate it, let, me do, let us do it, Lord, under your glory. Because we love you, let us celebrate and enjoy time with family. and Just getting together and enjoying the pretty sights. But help us to realize, Lord, that is not how we celebrate your birth. Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us, for all that you have blessed us with. We love you, Lord. Amen. All right. <clears throat> Questions? Comments? You can give me a Grinch costume, that'd be fine. <clears throat> I don't think he's got anything to do with Christmas either. I think that's another one. Stole it from who? The Christians? I'm trying to steal it from the Christians. <laughs> I'm just trying to disconnect it, you know, so they don't, they don't connect it with things that are, things that are biblical. All right, Bob uh, Krushank says, your source quote, quote, referring to the date of Christ's death rather than his birth, is probably correct. They were actually more interested in calculating the date of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. The December 25th date for Christ's birth was actually a byproduct of this effort. The entire process was quite convoluted, in my humble opinion. So, okay, that quote was right. Um, it just kind of struck me when I read that. I was like, what we're talking about is... But I, I get what you're saying. Thanks, Bob, for the clarification. Um, all right, let's uh, close by singing a, another song about his birth. Gary? I wouldn't go as so far to say we're blaspheming when we try to keep Christ in it. I think people have right motives. They think Christmas is supposed to be about Christ. And so somehow it, it kind of baptizes or sanctifies our, our traditions if we put Christ in there. Like, oh, everything's wonderful because it's all about Him. When really, 
I mean, just think. It's nothing about him, okay? Nothing we do, you know, points people to Christ during that time. I mean, if we're going to celebrate his birth, let's pick it. A, let's actually do it on September 11th and, and somehow make it be about him instead of about us. Because Christmas is more about us than anything. Christmas celebrators are going to war over this. That's what I said. They're going over to war. You know, what's, what, when Stan was doing Voice of the Mars, I'm just thinking, you know, these, they're being persecuted for celebrating Christmas, and it has got nothing to do with Christ. <laughs> just the, these, these Christians in other lands need to say, we're having a Christmas celebration. It's nothing to do with Christ. We're just having fun. You know, tree, connect tree with the Bible. Where do you get that? Well, there's trees in the Bible, but... You know, I don't think they put decorations on them. I know, Jeremiah, people say, oh, they cut the tree down, they decorate it. That's a, that is not a Christmas tree, people. That's an idol. <laughs> but I've heard that passage be used for Christmas trees. You know, the, people will do that kind of stuff.